Hey, we'd like to welcome you to uh, our service today online and pray that, uh, man, God really speaks to you uh, through all that we look at, through the worship time, through our prayer time. And uh, just in a little while, you can say, wow, I've had truly an experience with God. And, and anytime during the message or for the worship or any part, we, we'd like to just, if you take a moment to maybe have a question, join our email that we send out each week. Um, perhaps share a prayer request, a spiritual step you'd like to take. We have different ways you can do that. You can obviously text or email. One thing a few of you asked me via email was, uh, is there a way to send a letter to the church or a note to you through the church? We're also throwing in the, uh, the mailing address over there as well. So if you have a, a, a prayer request, just something where we can really minister to you, please uh, feel free to, to share that with us. Um, we're continuing our series on Exodus, Journey to Freedom, just visiting the reality that God would love to lead you and me free, set us free from the things that are driving us to the peace of Him leading us. And, uh, you know, just how liberating some of the things we've been reading and seeing in the last few weeks, looking at the story of Moses in the Old Testament. And I, I pray it'll speak to all of us again today. Uh, you know, one thing that fascinates me is... Uh, what, what drives people? What, what do people focus on? You know, infomercials are just totally intriguing to me to see some of the things that are advertised that can change your life. You know, cutting edge cookware, a knife that'll revolutionize everything. And, and uh, you know, just see these things, you're intrigued. Back in the 90s, I remember the, um, you know, thing that would uh, firm up your thighs, the thigh master. It just blows my mind. People would send in the the money to buy these things, thinking it'll just change them. Or even watching a commercial and uh, you see it and you're thinking, really, I don't really think that guy drinks as much beer as he advertises that he does. Um, I don't know if that shampoo, that breath mint, or that mouthwash really can change my life as much as the ad's going. Or sometimes a joke between my wife and I, if you know the, the product well, I'll you know, put on you know, deodorant or something made by this company and say, look out, you've seen the commercial. And she just looks at me and dismisses it quickly. But as you think about it, you know, uh, what does represent life change for you? Or, or you, can you cite uh, different parts of your life where you experience change? You know, the Bible tells us that we're Christ's ambassadors as if God was making his appeal through us to the world. And in so doing so, can you cite some examples from your own life? where, you know, God has changed you, maybe in your, the way you think, the way you speak, the desires you have, the choices you make. Um, what are some ways God tangibly has really changed your life? Because those are the stories that people really want to hear and the stories that people cling to. An example for a lot of us is the area of money. You know, Jesus had some interesting takes on money. Um, he looked at a couple guys and said, I need you to sell all your possessions uh, at the same time, he kind of dismissed Solomon, the great king, and compared him to the lilies of the field. And then he celebrated with a woman who took her most uh, priceless possession, broke it open, and washed Jesus' feet with it. But at the end of the day, I think Jesus would com communicate to all of us his truth that you can't take it with you. In fact, he really drives home something that I think is relevant for all of us in our modern day with all that's taking place in our world. He says, you know, where you're treasure is, that, that's where your heart really is. If, if you treasure money, that's really what your life is all about. If you treasure your family, or if you treasure your job, you treasure your pleasure life, or leisure life, or possession, what, whatever your treasure is, that truly is where your heart is. And, and we've seen that God desires to set us free from an addiction. Now, by addiction, again, we're referring to something that's just driving you. And in fact, in recent weeks, we've named the, the uh, given a great definition. It's a compulsive need for someone or something. And we've labeled that person or that thing or that group as good, and, and they're not God. And they're driving us. They're uh, almost forcing us to do the things we're doing. It's, it's almost like we're losing control of it. So what we're seeing this today is that God would love to play a role in delivering you and me setting us free, as we saw last uh, weekend, free, uh, free indeed. Now, as we go through this again, I, I want to really uh, nail down something that Paul tells us in the New Testament, that we're in a battle. We're in a warfare. This is not just, I'm going to stop this and start that. I, I just got to get a better attitude, a positive perspective. 
it's not as trivial as that. In fact, Paul says, listen, man, it, it's going to take God. It, it's going to require God to do something through you and in you, and that's what has to take place. So what I'd like us to do is walk pretty quickly through the story between Pharaoh and Moses. And Moses uh, does the 10 plagues we'll look at uh, today. And as we look at those, I want you to think, and I as well thinking about, how do these things resonate with us about setting us free from the very things that are, in a sense, our masters? Uh, So we're going to begin in the book of Exodus chapter 7, and it's a captivating point in the story because it says that Aaron had a staff in his hand, and Moses also had one God gave him, and uh, then Aaron took his staff and he threw it down and it becomes a snake. And then likewise, uh, Pharaoh's officials throw uh, their staffs down and they become snakes as well. But what's fascinating is that Aaron's snake swallows up the other snakes, now, you might think, well, you know, what's the, the power of that? It's this, that God said, hey, Aaron, hey, Moses, this is my battle. It, this isn't you versus Pharaoh. This is me versus Pharaoh. And in the end, I'm just going to tell you straight up, I'm going to win and demonstrate it. Now, you might think, why, why a snake? Well, in ancient times, snake was a part of the political side of Egypt. And so by Moses and Aaron, the snake from Aaron's staff eating the two snakes of the magicians of the Pharaoh, it signified the ultimate victory of God. Now, you might even think a little more impressed in the sense that Pharaoh had to require magicians to help him, and God really didn't need Moses and certainly didn't need Aaron. At the same time, he allowed them to be his representatives in this situation. Now, um, just an opinion here, but I think and I'm pretty feeling pretty good about this, that I think even God worked through the magicians to do what the magicians did because he had an agenda with them, and we'll see what I'm talking about in, two, in just a second. But we move to the first, uh, the first um, plague that happens, and it's with the Nile River, and God says, Moses, you're going to strike the Nile River, and I'll strike it, and it'll be changed, changed into blood, and fish will die, it'll, it'll be catastrophic. Now, for the the Egyptians, the Nile represented a god. It it was something very profound for them in the sense that it represented a god to them. And so it was basically Moses' god versus their god of the Nile. And and we see what happens, and it is quite fascinating that, that God defeated it by turning it into blood. And we see that God, in a sense, involves creation by changing the water into blood. And God basically was saying, Pharaoh, you may feel you have some power over people, but I have power over all of all of creation. Now, now in the uh, New Testament, Jesus does something of the same. They're at a wedding in Canaan, Galilee, and they're out of wine. Jesus steps in, tells them to fill the ceremonial jars up, uh, big giant containers with water, and he turns the water into wine. Do you remember the story? Well, let's look at it for a minute. It says, fill the jars with water. They filled them to the brim. The master of the banquet came up. The guy in charge, the, the director of the whole catering event, comes up and he tests the wine, and he's like, okay, I got to find out where this came from. Why? Well, look at this next statement. You saved the best until now. Now, why did Jesus do this water into wine? Why did God turn the uh, Nile, Mo- uh, Nile water into blood? Because of this. Jesus did this in Cana of Galilee, was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. Why, why did God turn the water of the Nile River into the blood? Because he wanted to do the same, to reveal his glory far superior to anything that Pharaoh could be. But we keep going and we find the second plague. Um, at, well, let me ask you the question that flows out of this, all right? So if God can turn, take care of creation and turn water into wine and water into blood, do you think for a moment today that God can deliver you from whatever your addiction might be, whatever's driving your life, whatever's just pushing you to do the things you're doing? Do you think God can set you free that he has that power? Now, let's move to the second one and let's continue looking at the battle between Pharaoh and not Moses or Aaron, but uh, Pharaoh and God. And we see that God says, all right, if you refuse to worship me, uh, I'm now going to send plague of frogs on to uh, you and your area. In fact, they'll be everywhere. It'll be totally disgusting to see what's going on with them. Now, you might think, what's 
12, God opposed to a frog. Again, in Egyptian times, the frog represented, represented the fertility goddess. The, the fertility goddess had a, a frog head. And so God was saying, look, I'm even greater than another goddess or another god. But at the same time, if you remember, so the frogs come up out of the Nile River, the same Nile River where God said, or Pharaoh had said, I want you to take the Hebrew, ba Hebrew babies and drown them. So, so here's God. Okay, the same water where you wanted to kill the Hebrew babies will be the same water that will produce the frogs. And the frogs represent fertility. But in your case, it will represent uh, the opposite, would represent death. Now, if you look down, continue reading, if you're looking in your Bibles at verses 6 and 7, the magicians did the same thing with their secret arts. And here's why I believe, again, I can't say I'm totally right, but I feel pretty good about it why I believe that God was actually leveraging the magicians almost in a mocking way with Pharaoh. It's this, because they also made frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Now, if I'm the Pharaoh and I have my guys on my team, I think I'm looking at them and saying, listen, I don't need any more frogs. I think the miracle I need from you is to get rid of the frogs and maybe drive them back into the Nile. Yeah, we don't, we don't need more. We actually need less. And so that's one of the many reasons that I think um, that, that God uh, perhaps was at work even through the magicians and what was going on. But as you really think about it for a minute, you know, it's nothing wrong with the frog. It, you know, nothing really wrong with the frog at all. But, you know, sometimes God uh, takes something very, very uh, ordinary that he's made to be good. And sometimes, um, you know, we can, we can transfer it to be something where, um, you know, we just, we just want more, we want more, we want more, you know, and, and God says, uh, you know, enough with that. I, I made something good to be enjoyed a little bit, or maybe to be used a little bit, maybe as medicine or something, but definitely not to be indulged. And so as you think about your own life, maybe you have a habit. And it's something God created to be good. It can be food. It can be medicine. It can be some kind of drug that helps people uh, perhaps to feel better. It can be sexuality. I mean, God created that. It can be anything that God made. And, and an overabundance of it, where you feel like you never have enough, can create that addiction, which in a sense, metaphorically, can be representative of, of the frogs and their story. And so my question to all of us today is this one. Do you think God can deliver you from that habit that uh, he created something good, but you've indulged in it, you've overindulged in it, and because of that, you become addicted to that very, very thing? Do you think God can set you free from that? Well, let's keep going, and we'll look at plague number three. And God talked to them about uh, dust being spread over the land. Ultimately, it would become, uh, become gnats. And in verses 18 and 19, we see the magic magicians tried to do this one. Notice very quickly they couldn't. I, I just think God said, I I'm done utilizing you guys. Time for you to step aside. But here's what's fascinating. These magicians said to the Pharaoh, this truly is the finger of God. And so let me ask all of us this real simple question. Uh, do you think only God can provide the deliverance that you crave? Or do you live with the false notion that, you know, I can quit whenever I want. I can quit being angry. I can quit guilt, being guilt-ridden. I can quit being performance-based. I can quit my secret habit anytime I want. Or do you really realize, no, only by God and only by the power of a loving God can I truly be set free from that? Well, moving on to the fourth, uh, we see um, all of a sudden, now we're moving on to, uh, you know, what we would call the, the gnats and them coming in and invading and all that's going on. And they're going to come in swarms of flies on your uh, officials and people and houses, Egyptians, full of them. It's going to be covered. It's going to be a horrible, horrible thing. But in this part, I'd really like you to notice something about uh, the flies here. It says, but on, on that day, I'll do, do differently with my people. My people in Goshen will have a different experience. And their experience will be, I will protect them. No swarm of flies will come upon them at all. I've, I've got them covered. You, you don't have to worry about that at all. And, and I think this is very profound for you and for me to understand something about God. And uh, Romans chapter 5 says it so well. 
that while we were God's enemies, that, that God came, that Christ came and died. God sent His Son to die for us. And, and if He did that, how much more does He want to do with us, in us, through us, now that we belong to Him? I mean, it's a great thing to think about. For some of us, it's really not, can God? The deeper issue is, does God want to deliver me from my addiction, the thing that's just driving me with no mercy, the thing that's just feeding my, my temper and making me impatient and terrified and worried and anxious and fearful, and keeping me up at night. Does God really want to deliver me from that? And what a, what a great question to think about because, you know, God protected his people in Goshen as the entire Egyptian was, uh, land of Egypt was suffering with the flies so don't you think God wants to provide the deliverance we crave? We know He can, but does He really, really want to? Now we keep going and we come to uh, plagues number five is uh, the livestock. Number six, boils on your skin. Number seven, uh, we come to hail and we read this. Uh, it, God says, okay, um, I'm doing this so that you may know there's no one like me and all the earth and the hailstorm would have come uh, right after that. No, no longer is it just about Pharaoh and God, it's God and the world. God wanting the entire world at that time and even now through the record of the story for us to understand and to know there's no one like him. Pharaoh's nowhere close to him, no one alive today, no one who's ever been alive is anywhere close to being like God and his son, Jesus Christ. But let's move on to plague number eight. And in plague number eight, uh, we all of a sudden, we learn that God's at work and doing something profound. But look at what he says, okay? Uh, I want you to tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt with the Egyptians. And I want you to do that, that, that you may know that I am the Lord. And so as we talk about, you know, the the eighth plague and, and God's working here in this story, in this situation. Um, I want to resonate here with this one statement, okay? What are you teaching your kids and grandkids? Are you teaching them just the facts and just the, 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 the academic side? You know, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the cross is. And all of which are significant. I'm not diminishing that. But I like what God says here. I'd also like God said you to tell the stories of your interaction with me. The times when I stepped in and I did something incredibly profound. The time when, um, you know, you wrestle with perhaps infertility or uh, you're in a, a relationship that just wasn't going well, loss of job, economic chaos, disease, illness, whatever it might have been. And at that moment, God stepped into your situation and he did something profound. And those are the things that really challenge people's you know, faith and, and helps them to understand at a deeper level um, that God really does love us and God really can do some amazing things. It's not just enough to learn the information, but to tell the stories of transformation where God changed us, stepped in and did, did the unbelievable. And so that brings me to the, the next question. It, it, do, you, do you think it's important to tell our kids and grandkids how God has done amazing things in our lives? So that they hunger for God to do some of those same things in their life as well. Where God's just not this academic thing they learn about. But that God actually is interactive with us relationally, spiritually, and we would truly like to just radically touch our life and do some of those amazing things again. Moving on to plague number nine, we talk about the darkness. And uh, darkness covered all of Egypt for three days. Um, people walking around really couldn't, didn't have any earthly idea all that was going on and uh, just, just an amazing time. And God really is resonating here at a much bigger level. He's not just wanting to say, okay, it's me versus Pharaoh. It's me with creation. It's me with the animal kingdom. Uh, it's me doing amazing things that the world will know. But here God actually goes to the very, very beginning of the book of Genesis and the opening pages say this, in the midst of the chaos and the darkness and all that was going on, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And here in the ninth plague, God basically says, and let there be darkness. And there was darkness. Now, this was uh, the final God of the Egyptian group. It was a, the sun god, Ray, 
And so God defeated that uh, quote-unquote Egyptian God as well. And we return, though, to Exodus chapter 10. Look at verse 23. Yet all the Israelites, they had light where they were, reminding us again of God wanting to deliver us, has the power to deliver us, does care enough to be a part of your story and of mine. And then we come to the tenth and the final plague. And, and God said, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh, Moses, and then he'll send you, it'll be time to go. One more and it'll be done. Ten, and it's all complete, and he'll be ready for you to go. And the plague is this, every firstborn son. It doesn't matter if it's of the Pharaoh, if it's of a female slave, uh, it doesn't matter if it's of a cattle, you know, a calf, a cat, you know, whatever it might, any animal, whatever it might be, that firstborn will die. But unless God gives uh, an exemption here, and he goes on to say, uh, here's something I'd like you to do in preparation. And from this, we get the story of the Passover. I want you to be ready to go. It was like a faith moment. Don't wait for the opportunity. You are ready to go. And when the opportunity's there, you're ready to go. Get your bread unleavened so you're ready to make that time to leave. And then here is the way to avoid it. On that same night, again, he says, I'll pass through, strike down the firstborn of anybody, anything, unless there's blood on the signpost, on the doorpost. And when that is true, I will pass over that and no destructive plague will touch that home, touch that house. In other words, God was saying, I am more powerful than the current king. I'm more powerful than the future king who is the son of the Pharaoh. I'm more powerful than any future king out there who will ever come along. In fact, God says, I'm more powerful over darkness, the river, the frogs, hail, boils on the skin, flies, gnats, everything. And on top of all of that, I'm even more powerful than life and death itself. I can provide life and death, and I can exempt someone from death. How powerful is that? I mean, you think about it, God is the God who is God over all things and in all ways, because even the pharaohs would die, and we know that by the giant pyramids and the places they're buried in Egypt. But if you think about it for a minute, our entire belief system actually does hinge on this truth. In the book of Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking in the, in the city of Athens, the group of pretty much secular people. And here's what he said, God has set a day when he'll judge the world by Jesus whom he's appointed. And God has, I love this, God's given proof of this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. Our entire belief system hinges not just on God's power to bring light out of darkness or that he can turn water into wine or water into blood or bring frogs out of a river. Our entire belief system, as we know it, hinges on one truth. It's this one, that Jesus Christ died and truly was risen was raised from the dead. In fact, Paul sums it up almost like a lawyer presenting a case in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, listen, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, and truth be known, your faith is, is a waste of time. And we're lying about God. We're false witnesses about God. I mean, everything we're saying about Him is a bunch of garbage because it's not true. Paul continues, he says, you know, if Christ hasn't been raised... Your faith is futile. It's a waste of time, and you're still in your sins. I mean, you're still up the proverbial creek. All those who have died, they're not in heaven with God. They're, they're you know, in a horrible, horrible place. And, and in fact, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, we, we ought to be pitied and made fun of by everybody. I mean, we, we ought to be mocked by everybody that you know. In other words, it all hinges on that one reality that God has power over death. I mean, that's the hope that we all have. So as we come to the end of today, the, the one reason we have hope is that God can and God wants to and, and God will deliver us from things that are mer have no mercy in forcing us to do the things we do, whether it's lust or greed or guilt or shame or unresolved choices from the past, uh, you know, almost like post-traumatic stress from bad events. I mean, God wants to deliver us from all of those things. And what gives us the hope of knowing that is this one truth, is that Jesus Christ died and raised from the dead. And the idea is that if God can raise people from the dead, 
He can take care of anything else that we face. He has the power to do whatever needs to happen in your life and in mine because He is truly God. You might be watching this and wondering, wait, wait, how do you know Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, back in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us that there was a 40-day period between the day Jesus rose from the dead and He returned to heaven. And during those 40 days, get this, He interacted with over 500 skeptics. He ate with them. He talked with them. They touched him. They listened to him. They heard him. They listened to him teach. 500. In fact, in the letter, Paul says, many are still alive. You can go ask them if you would like, and they'll tell you what it was like. Living testimonies, living eyewitnesses to the event. And because Jesus rose from the dead, we can have the hope to know that God truly will, does desire, and can do something special in our lives and set us free. So at the end, during the night, just as God promised, Moses was summoned by Pharaoh, just like God had said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, get out of here. Leave, you're set free, go. That is exactly what I hope you and I long to have, is for you and me to experience this amazing statement where God says, you're free, get up, stand up, you're free, all that junk that's been forcing you and, 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 and just forcing its agenda on you and guiding you, all that stuff, you're free. Come, follow me, and you'll be free, free indeed. And I pray that's your prayer today, that you'll truly trust God like never before and be free indeed. And, and maybe for someone who's watching this, maybe this is your first time ever to say, well, I'm not just going to trust God to set me free. I'd like to trust God for eternity as well. And by trusting God, by asking His Son Jesus to come live in your life. And earlier, uh, I, I pointed out, um, yeah, what, so trusting God for our own exodus. Um, but earlier today, I, I said, you know, when you get to that point in your life where you'd like to take that spiritual step, man, we love to hear about it from you. Or, uh, you know, maybe need a prayer requests about t trusting God. Maybe there's something hindering you from doing that. And then finally, like I said earlier, you can email us to us, text us, send a letter to us, and let us know about that decision you've made. So Father, at the end, we just ask you will embold, just, just give us courage and boldness today to trust you like never before. Many to trust Jesus and receive eternal life. For the rest of us to trust you because Christ lives in us by faith that we would be set free you want to, you can, and you've shown you have power over all things, including life and death. And if you can do that, you can set us free. Thank you for that invitation. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We give God all the glory for the great things he's done. Please sing along with us this morning.
Christ is my reward in all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Each week, I like to remind all of you who give through our local church fellowship here, um, just a, an idea of the money that we all give doesn't go just to a number or a budget or something like that, but actually goes to change lives. And so in recent uh, weeks, we, we've been excited to celebrate our pumpkin patch. I don't know if you've had a chance, if you live in our local area to visit or not, but it's been an amazing time. 
And, uh, you know, if you give money through this local church, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the pumpkins, but all the other stuff, setting the, the experience. And you might wonder, well, why is that so significant? Well, this year we've had literally, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds and hundreds of families who have come. They don't go to church anywhere or they're new to the area. They move from places like Kentucky, Ohio, New England, uh, Canada, South Florida, the West Coast, Colorado. And they've come and said, you know, we know nothing about the community. And uh, we, can we come? Can we participate? We've invited them. We've had a chance to interact with them. And even some have been uh, started coming to our services. And so we just want to thank your investment. Again, the, today is not global. It's not just continental or it's not just a state, but it's local. And because of that, we are seeing people literally coming to church, hearing the good news of Christ, getting involved, all because of your investment and the pumpkin patch. How, how, how amazing is that? So each week, again, we just like to remind you the different ways you can give and invest your resources through this local church to see lives impacted. Father, again, thank you as we do each week for the generosity of so many, many people. And Lord, we, we've seen in recent weeks uh, places in Asia, we've seen places in North America and cities and other places like that, even closer to home right here on our campus. Father, to see hundreds of families come, unconnect, disconnected from any church, maybe many just new to the area, just arriving here in the last weeks and months. And Lord, to, to, to have a chance to impact their lives in a, a great way through this pumpkin patch. I thank you for all who invest to make it possible. And uh, Lord, we don't take care of the pumpkins. That's a whole other matter. But just creating the setting where people can come and experience uh, your people in a loving way. That's such an amazing thing. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.